Well, I think people feel this place, you know, viscerally, is that the word I want, inside yeah. themselves. And when you're out working in the environment out here, I would know the moment that sun came over the horizon in the morning, you know, it just mm-hmm. nails right into you in the summertime. Yeah. Work in our own property, you start to see the uh, the roadrunners have it, like a little route that they do. And the lizards even have, the, I think, right. long tails up there. They have a route that they do at sure. certain times of the day. So you start really appreciating. I think most people that move here, once you get that appreciation for it, you're going to do what you need to do to protect. Hi, and welcome to the Desert Lady Diaries podcast, a weekly conversation with women who found their home in the Mojave Desert. I'm Dawn Davis, and this is episode 104. If you'd like more information about the podcast, it's all at the website DesertLadyDiaries.com, and I invite you to engage with the guests, with other listeners, or me on social media, on Facebook and Instagram at Desert Lady Diaries, or on Twitter at Desert Lady Diary. Janet Armstrong Johnston is a licensed architect and contractor. She graduated from the University of Cincinnati Co-op Architecture Program and headed to the Bay Area of California to design and build projects. She was a founding member of CASBA, which is the California Straw Building Association, an advisory board member for years, and developed and ran the two professional training courses. She towed her trailer to Joshua Tree to build the Harrison Straw Bale Vault in 1998, meeting her awesome English rock climber husband, George Armstrong, at a Halloween party at Todd Gordon's house. They decided to settle in Joshua Tree to raise their two kids and run Strong Arm Construction. They are currently building their own home, have volunteered extensively for the kids' schools, and are very involved with the desert and the community. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. What was your first experience with desert? Well, my family, we were on the East Coast in the Philadelphia area, and my dad's one and only uncle lived in San Diego. Oh, wow. So on summers, occasionally, we would take trips out west to go see our uncle, Mm -hmm. you know, or his uncle. And on one of those trips, actually might have been two, we went through New Mexico and Albuquerque. And let's just say I was absolutely in love. Mm. (laughs) So basically, I decided that I have to come back to this place. So later, I went to Cincinnati for school. Mm -hmm. And um, the co-op program was actually really good there. It was a six-year program that had um, a five-year professional degree. Mm. So you basically shoved five years of work, uh, schoolwork into four years. Oh, wow. But then you had two years of work experience, but it was interspersed through the program. So you would go mm. to school, then you'd go to work, then you'd go to school, then you'd go to work. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, you went all over the place, and everyone did this. So it was like this real like cumulative experience yeah. type thing. Great way to integrate what you're learning. Yeah, exactly. Immediately, yeah. And you realize like what you want to focus on by mm. doing that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So long way around, I'll get, I'll get to the desert again. Again, don't worry but my <laughs> so I was what 19 and I had the revelation that I really wanted to do construction so I was in architecture school I wanted to do construction that's not wasn't that common at the time sure and uh, one of my friends mentioned Habitat for Humanity in Georgia it's not the desert <laughs> no it's not I lived in Charlotte yeah so it's not. I bought a, a Toyota Tercel a used Toyota Tercel for like 600 bucks the night before I left it was stick shift I didn't know how to drive it oh, Lord. my friend gave me lessons in the one of the woods by Cincinnati and off I went down and of course I broke down Tennessee but eventually I get down to um, America's Georgia and I'm actually living in the international community there and that was all the people that were volunteering and building mm. so that's how I started doing construction oh neat yeah I was like I had to do it for free <laughs> we got a, a weekly pig check it was called for Piggly Weekly Piggly Wiggly oh Piggly Wiggly yeah, yeah exactly <laughs> actually it was monthly so somewhere in there, I, uh, you know, found enough food and gas money. But anyway, the point of all this was I was in their office at one of the buildings, and I saw Time Magazine, and um, there was an article about Antoine Preduck, um, who was an architect in Albuquerque. And it was basically light bulbs went off. Oh, because I was, desert. Yeah, yeah, I was having a real hard time, too, in the architecture program, finding my place, because it was so, you know male and (laughs) not so much people wise but this is what they were focusing on and I won't say names Peter Eisenman you know that kind of design just all mental design and I wanted something about people about Mm. spaces and about landscape Mm -hmm. so here is Antoine Peduck and the light bulbs went off I'm like okay I'm gonna try and work for this guy on one of my co-ops so anyway so I went back to school I called and I called for the next co-op which Mm -hmm. was like another you know six months later after after some school and like no we don't have a place we don't have a place you know, can't do it this time. So I ended up going to New York City. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then I worked for one of the big name <gasps> architects, and it was very interesting. <laughs> I loved being in New York City, but I really realized I had no interest in that at all. 
Mm. It was not my type of people, yeah. not my scene. Anyway, so the next round comes up back in school, and I'm calling, calling, calling. Nope, sorry, no job, no job. And luckily, some of the professors at the school were very supportive and are like work study guy, and they're like, just go. You know, it's okay. Wow. We're, we're allowed, you know, you're so into this, just go to New Mexico. So when my time arrived for the next co op, I piled in the car, and actually, two other friends did the drive with me because they were working in the area. You know, we all mm. had to change jobs every three months. So I get to Albuquerque and I called and I went for an interview, but still didn't have any work. And I still remember him asking me what I was going to do if he didn't hire me. And I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, what I did, because it took a month or so before he did end up hiring me, was um, I ended up living in the youth hostel in Albuquerque in exchange. You know, so I worked mm-hmm. there in exchange for the place. Sure. And then I got a job at the Village Inn Pancake House, which was awesome. <laughs> and I worked the night shift on, it was the end of the cruise strip on uh, 66. So that was educational. Sure. <laughs> oh, my god! It was definitely a different group of people than I was used to. And I, I, I went in there. It was good. And uh, why I was bringing up the youth hostel and actually Habitat as well was, you know, I really started to meet quirky people, let's mm-hmm. say, right? Right. And I realized these were my people, people that just had wide, diverse experiences mm-hmm. and talked about things and, you know, knew that's what I wanted in my life, mm-hmm. like, all the time, which is kind of like Joshua Tree. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, finally I got the job with um, Pre-Dog, and, oh, and that wow. was actually a six-month work session. So with the desert, though, so I'm in Albuquerque, and somehow between running the desk at the hostel, you know, when it was my shifts and everything, and, and working full-time with him, went all over the place. I mean, just yeah. everywhere. Like, every weekend. I took that, um, the Indian Country AAA map. Oh, wow. Um, like, yeah, yeah. I love that map. <laughs> and there's actually a whole article about how it was done. I think the guy's a hero that goes out in his truck and maps all these places. Oh, my goodness. So it just became, like, you know, essentially my Bible of what mm-hmm. I wanted to see and do. Yeah. And, and luckily there'd be people to travel with because I was in the youth hostel. Right. So yeah, it was fantastic. It was just fantastic. What a great experience. Yeah. So I knew, and, and I was looking at uh, UNM and Albuquerque for maybe coming back for grad school, which mm-hmm. I never ended up doing. You know, it was in my mind, maybe I would go back to Albuquerque. Sure. So anyway, all that happens, more happens, more happens, you know, get done school, which was, you know, stressful and long and, and good at the same time. <laughs> right. And then luckily one of my, my last work experiences was in um, Berkeley. So luckily I got graduated in 1992 yes I'm old some people that are from the school (laughs) anyway so I had he offered me a job in Berkeley so that got me out to the Bay Area okay yeah and uh, I actually didn't go through the desert on that trip but I had like Mm. a drive across country and camping out and everything yeah so is so, that where you started with skillful means design and construction? Yeah, not right away, but okay. yeah, I had my other um, company I was working with, and of course it was 1992, which was the recession, so I've been so lucky to have three recessions for my career. Ha, sarcasm, <laughs> big time. But I was one of the few people at my school, because usually we had like 100% employment mm, where everyone yeah. had a job. In this case, because of the recession of 92, I think it was down to 25, and a oh lot of gosh. people were losing their jobs as they were driving across country. Oh, no. So I was seriously lucky that I had the job when I got there. It only lasted three months, and then he tanked. Oh, gosh. <laughs> then I waited tables again. Right. But that was great. Always a good skill to yeah, have. Yeah, <laughs> it was actually really good because I actually could be a 20-year-old and, you know, have time and everything yeah. as well versus, you know, when you're working in architecture or construction, sure. it's all the time. It's yeah. It's weekends, it's nights, Long it's hours. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And a lot of stress. So anyway, but yeah, so I, w- I wanted to go again, pursue the construction. Right. And I had been working with a contractor in Berkeley before that when I got laid off. And I saw a um, advertisement for a design build school in Vermont. This is a little confusing. <laughs> so I decided, okay, I'm, I'm gonna. I made it work. That I could do a work exchange. I could camp out. Oh, cool! This is and it was all the Princeton people. So they all had money and cost okay. a fortune. But you know, yeah. I did it all free, basically. That's the yes tomorrow. Design. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And it was a whole long story. But I had interviewed with John Swearing and Skillful Means like okay. right before oh. I got the go ahead to go to um, Vermont and. John went off on retreat because he's a Tibetan Buddhist. <laughs> and he's like, well, I'll think about whether I'm going to hire you or not. And his well, famous... seemed to work out perfectly. Yeah, for construction. <laughs> his famous quote was, my only advantage was I spoke English <laughs> in oh terms of being hiring me for construction, Whoa. which is funny. Yeah. <laughs> True, actually, <laughs> at the time. So anyway, as I was leaving Berkeley to, you know, get out to Vermont for this month or two, I forget how long it was, um, design build school. And, and actually, I was the first one for sustainable design oh, neat. build. Yeah, so we, we got all the big names coming up, you know, William McDonough, just all kinds of names for 
would never be doing it later because it right. was the first time. Yeah. You know, it was like, this is 93 at this point. Like a new idea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And as I'm leaving, I saw a sign in the library at Berkeley about advertising a talk about straw bale construction. I'm like, what the heck is that? You know? Mm. <laughs> so it went off, but I couldn't be there. I was going to be gone. Right. So then I, I'm in Vermont and my work exchange job was bringing materials for the material library. You know, you have... In offices, and I call Mott's Mirmum at um, Out on Bale, which is down in Tucson, oh. and they also published The Last Straw, so everything's puns in Straw Bale, <laughs> and I'm talking to him, I'm like, oh my god, these people are amazing, these are the best people ever, you know, type of thing. Anyway, get back, John hires me, and it turns out he had a project ready to go, the first load-bearing permitted straw bale. And that was going to be in Chinoa, up in Northern California. Okay. So that kind of started the whole building straw bale and living on the job sites. So I basically just gave up having an apartment after a while because all the job sites were just all over the place. Mm. So it was just my truck, my dog, my yeah. two cats. <laughs> oh Somehow my I kept them all alive, yeah. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> and we're job site to job site and a lot of floors and, you know, things like that. Yeah. Uh, for like a decade. <laughs> oh my gosh. A long time. So then yeah. it was through that company that Lou Harrison house yeah. was built. Yeah. So like right? we were working on a project, I think it was Mill Valley and John says, oh, I got this call from this 79 year old composer and he's internationally famous and to be honest I did not know his name but our client we were in her like kitchen because mm-hmm. we tended to have our meetings in her kitchen she <laughs> it, like, but she's like oh my god Lou Harrison she went running and got his music wow. and everything so then that was 97 mm-hmm. I think it was and then we had a, all kinds of history with it <laughs> But that's how you did that. How you ended up back here in Joshua Tree? Eventually, yeah. It's right? also how I end up having my seems like twenty year epic. I won't say battles, but interactions, epic interactions oh. with San Bernardino County. Right. Started then, <laughs> <laughs> and it basically took us three years and, and my determination, to be honest, yeah. to, to make it happen. Right. You know, just and it wasn't just myself. Obviously, it was John, and we had David Mars as an engineer. Right. Bruce King was an engineer previously on it. We just a whole team of people. So many people contributed so wow. much time. We had to do an arch test to mm-hmm. prove it was going to work wow. and get the the figures of that to mm-hmm. the county and everything. And right. it, just, it was a, a long process. So actually, I came here, towed the trailer down. Right. <laughs> it was just me at that point. I knew one person here, which was a friend of Lou Harrison's name, named George Lenz. And I was going to park the trailer in his yard. Okay. He tended to be in L.A. working. So mm. I like, literally Perfect. knew nobody. Right. <laughs> <laughs> when I first came out here. And it, there was no crossroads yet. No water canyon. Oh, um, my gosh. There was a park center deli. That's Where yeah, was that? You know, just right across from Coyote Corner. Oh, where the park cafe is. Yeah, now. exactly. Okay. So right. I ended up, you know, that was my, it became my social yeah. world for right. that. Those early, very hot, very, um, you know, stormy summer yeah. <laughs> of trying to get this project going. It's so funny. I talk to so many people who come here and they've come here in the summertime. Yeah. It's really. Oh, yeah. And I had no air thing. conditioning, like <laughs> right. you said, in the trailer. Right. Because I think whatever I, I, I don't know what my excuse was. For some reason, I could not figure out how to get an air conditioner in the trailer. Mm. Now I'm kind of like, what was up? But at the time, it just didn't seem to be possible. Right. <laughs> might have been funds. I don't know. It might have been money factor, probably. So I had the whole summer, yeah, just we would try and get to work really early. And, sure. And, you know, get home. And yeah. I was attacked by red ants at one point. One red ah. ant. It was amazing how much damage one red ant could do to you. <laughs> Three days of torture. Oh, my so I learned, oh, and then there was also a fire. Like, yeah, the, the third day oh, I no. think I was there. And I had no idea what to do. I had been around in the Oakland Hills fire, mm-hmm. you know, but that was there. And, and this, I didn't know. You couldn't see because it was smoke. And I'm like, mm. where is it? And oh, my goodness. I went up to some neighbor in the road above and, um, you know, his lens was gone. And I said, what's going on? He's mm. like, it was over the hills. This is an above friendly hills. Mm-hmm. And anyway, so that's how he told me about wow. Z107. So I started okay. listening to Z107, which mm-hmm. kind of slowly got me knowing what was going on in the community. Yeah. Basically. Oh, wow. Yeah. And at the park center, it was awesome. Cause it was like a whole little community. That's where I met Mike Smiley, Ted Quinn, mm-hmm. and Ethan from Coyote Corner and oh, wow. Candy, everyone who worked there. Like uh-huh. um, Doreen has passed away, unfortunately. It was just a great SD, just great group of people. Well, I love hearing yeah. what other things were in places before they are what I know them as. Today. Yeah, that's, well, that's really cool. Yeah, and I look back now, and I'm like, I felt like you know I was coming to the Wild West. It was all alone, nothing mm. was here. But now, you know, I've totally was been involved with the kids' school at Friendly Hills for nine years, and wow. the kids have graduated out. Yeah. Now. But that was 
was happening. That was all going on when I was here by myself in sure. 1998, 99, you know? <laughs> Yeah, I just had no idea. So it was, it was interesting how there's all these little like circles and, and worlds, I guess, of perspective. Right. So. so now that you're here, and it's interesting that you mentioned, I didn't make that even make that connection when I was reading about the straw bale construction and the fact that you would have to interact with the San Bernardino <laughs> County and Planning Commission. Interact with it mildly. A, <laughs> yeah, which is a great segue into your activism in the community as far as like things like the Altamira Project or the Dollar General or things like that yeah. because you do actually have some background in how to work with them, if you will, or you kind of know what to expect. So talk to me a little bit about, because activism for me was kind of a big draw mm. as part of me moving here. When I started going online and reading, watching Mac meetings before I moved here, believe it or not, Ah. I'm a little boring. (laughs) But it's a great way to find out what's going on in your community or who the people are there and things like that. So I guess the question is, what do you think drives that spirit here? And it seems that people who move here do get involved in fighting seems like a strong word, but frankly, that's sometimes what we're doing is fighting against what the county thinks is okay to put here and what the people who actually live here say, no, it's not. Yeah. Well, I think people feel this place, you know, viscerally, is that the word I want? Inside themselves. And when you're out working in the environment out here, you know, like I would know the moment that sun came over the horizon in the morning, you know, it just Mm -hmm. nails right into you in the summertime. Working on our own property, you start to see the... uh, the roadrunners have like a little route that they do, and the lizards even have the I think right. long tail is there. They have a route that they do at sure. certain times of the day, so you start really appreciating. I think most people that move here that choose to move here, right? Because <laughs> anyway, that's another whole story. But yeah, definitely with the school, I've learned there's people that love the desert and people just don't get it, and mm. you know they tend to be moving through. But once you get that appreciation for it, you're gonna do what you need to do to protect it to keep it. Yeah, yeah and and. You know, without Tamira, that became, thank God, my husband's the same mind I am, mm-hmm. the primary thing, because we didn't want 105 acres just bladed right around the school. Of course, it is a place that houses can go if they're done right with the environment. That's It's exactly. not like there'll be nothing ever built there. Right. I know, but, you know, it's right surrounded by neighborhoods, yeah. but that was a whole different thing. And bleeding right. 105 acres and putting a wall around it is not what this place is about. No, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not against houses. Obviously, I'm an architect and a builder. Sure. It's just how something's done. Right. And, and that was part of it. It was just so against the logic in my head. And right. Offended, and I think I, I had guess, been here. It offended I want, me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think I had been here probably three weeks living here, and I was already formulating comments and driving up to White Feather, where the meeting oh, you know, right. is televised. Wow. And I basically saw it as... How could you buy property and think you're going to slam all those houses in here? Have you been here? Have yeah. you actually seen what it looks like? Have you even like Google mapped it to look yeah. at what it looks like? You, it's not the place. And then yeah. if you actually were coming here and met some of the people who live here and understood some of the dynamics and the economics of the place... Y- yeah, I, I don't know. It just made no sense to me. Yeah, no, it didn't. <laughs> but, you know, it's just, again, people have different perceptions. And, and the, the fellow we were working with was a nice man, mm. very nice. And he, uh, he had good intentions. I don't want to say he did not. So right. I think, yeah. honestly, it's just, you know, people have different perspectives. And they were coming mm-hmm. at it from, you know, this is how they're going to make their money. Mm-hmm. The period. You know, that was their right. perspective. Right. And that's okay. It's just, but not in that situation. <laughs> no, exactly. Well, I mean, even we just like... Looking... We need houses. We need right. housing here. We need more right. apartments. Right. We definitely need housing for a variety of economic levels. Right. And living situations and life situations. Um, so that worries me on the flip side where I'm hearing so many people, it's not everybody, mm. you know, that don't want anything built. I'm like, mm. well, no, it's just doing it right. I mean, exactly. you know, we've had like one new building in downtown Joshua Tree and like almost the whole time I've been here, wow. you know, literally a couple have been upgraded. There's not like people are going to know how much it's developing mm-hmm. and it's like, yes, yeah, so it's changing, but most of that is the vacation rentals and people redoing houses and, and there are houses being built, but like Kurt Sauer was saying for the water district, it's probably only about 
about 14 or so a year of new meters. Mm. So it's, it's that mm. is sustained. That is an okay amount. <laughs> that's sure, a good amount. exactly. But yeah, 248 yeah. at once popular is not right. Because right. that's so, a whole infrastructure yeah. change, quite frankly. Yeah, to, exactly. Yeah, and also it was more the fear they would blade it and then not be able to build it, and it would right. be a dust bowl. That was my yeah. big thing. Like I felt like if the bulldozer showed up, I had lost. Basically, yeah. or we had lost. You know, just right. like everything. And anyway, that became our basically our driving force like sure. that kind of well and our I, life decisions was and thank god it worked out yeah, exactly <laughs> after like almost 10 years it would have been like wow that was a lot of time for right still be exactly built. well and so. i think the thing that's impressive to people that i tell that to also is that you all started a gofundme to collect donations to hire attorneys and things like that and people chipped in what they could yeah. whether it was 10 or 25 dollars oh, or a thousand dollars and i think that really speaks also to the spirit of the people who live in this oh, community we had so many people across all political spectrums right. that were not into that and, and that made it easy for me because I like to get along with people I like people right. and I like people <laughs> across all kinds of different you know ways of life and everything sure. how. that's like I said about the Albuquerque and, right. and back at um, Habitat you know mm-hmm. it's just like wow what, you know what's driving you what are you doing that and you know trying mm-hmm. to you know I, I genuinely genuinely like 99.9% of people I like, you know, right. really like them, like they're yeah. good people. So anyway, so that's what was nice and easy for me because it was, mm-hmm. you know, it was something that totally made sense to almost everybody, right. no matter who they were, what life circumstance or what, <laughs> you know, what economic group or political group. Right, exactly. So, I think I lost the question though. What was that? <laughs> well, it, I, I think we can go on to a different question, which is what, for people new mm-hmm. moving to the area, what suggestions do you have for them, things that they can do, places they can go to be involved, to get involved? It seems like there's this core group of folks who've been here a long time, yourself and David Fick and Tom there's O'Key. And, oh, that's what I was going to say. But there's hundreds of people that are involved in that. I think it was you know easily 100 plus people right. involved in that. Together. But it seems to me like there's a core group of people that really are like the driving force of, you know, we can all go to a MAC meeting and we can all can yeah. talk. But then something's happening in the background where people are actually stepping up and taking action. Yeah. So for someone like me who wanted to be involved in that, I mean, is that just a matter of saying, hey, if something comes up and you guys need help with this, please involve me? Or what suggestions can you make for people that are new to the community to get involved in that? I don't really want to call it a circle, but that's the best, or that group of people. Mm -hmm. Um, Where does that start and what does that look like? Well, first off, one thing where we're at in our life is we're involved with a lot of different circles of people. We mm. have the school circle, we have the sports circle, <laughs> we have the environmental <laughs> circle, I've got the you know building circle of people, and they're different, and there's some sure. overlap, but you know I'm usually, like when I'm at the MAC meetings, there tends to be like maybe one or two people that might be in the school circle as well, and so mm-hmm. it's like, hey! Nobody's right. there. Like, oh, you're here too, you yeah. know, which is great. So that's one awareness for new folks, like in, in the, mm-hmm. the Mac circle, I call it, right? Okay, you know? yeah. And, you know, I tend to be one of the younger people there too. I'm yeah. not going to say my age. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a Gen Xer though, okay? I'm a proud Gen Xer. And it tends to be like a little bit older. And there's, right. some, there's various yeah. people. There's like a lot of 30 somethings, whatever, whatever heck generation that is at this point, millennials, I guess. So there's definitely some interaction. But, you know, one thing is, reading the paper, Facebook, there's different groups. There's a Joshua Tree Community Connection site. You have to kind of be in Joshua Tree to get in that, but, you know, it's pretty open. That helps a lot. That's yeah, for sure. That's the source of information. And the paper was great for me when I moved here. I yeah. really am a, I love the paper and the yeah. library. And that, that was, yeah, the library is perfect. You yeah. can really See, that, learn a lot. That's where you interact with, like, the moms and the dads right. and, the, and the folks that need the air conditioning because they don't have it at their house, right. you know, a yeah. place, or they don't have a house and they need a place there. So it was really just getting involved. I mean, in terms of the environmental group, mm-hmm. if that's what you're referring to, Morongo Basin Conservation Association. Right. Yeah. That would be the group, I'd say. To, okay join up with because they have right. a, a news flash that comes out I how often that is once I get it it's like once a month or every yeah. other week and if something important is coming up yeah, they exactly. send something out to let you know like send your comments yeah. and they tell you when it's due and sometimes they even give you some sample remarks or to tell you yeah. why these things are important to comment on oh, so definitely. that you can formulate comments that aren't just we don't want it yeah. you know it has to be exactly use, of some logic and why it's not appropriate education exactly i was just you know it's a huge brain trust and it's actually a large group of people that's Mm. what amazes me okay because even like 
Berkeley, for example. I mean, I was there for a while and I went to one or two meetings there and it really was like a tiny group of the same people. I lost interest pretty fast because sure. it was very, you know, homogeneous, let's say. Group. Yeah. Here, there is a lot more diversity. Even at the MAG meetings, we do have mm-hmm. more diversity of who goes to them mm-hmm. and, you know, what's being presented. So, you know, in terms of the environmental community, if that's someone's focus moving in here, definitely MBCA, Marble mm-hmm. Basin Conservation Association. And just like the brain trust in there is huge with Pat Flanagan, Lorraine Turk, just so many people. Dave, of course, that knows so much. Right. And, um, well, and that's the thing, too, that was so helpful about what you sent out about Altamira, because I think a lot of people moving here didn't even realize that was going on at the yeah. time. And I think to have that whole wrap-up post that you made to take it from the beginnings Mm -hmm. and all the way through to what steps were involved to get it to the point where we're done, that's not happening. Yeah, (laughs) I have to say, I usually have a hidden agenda, I call it. (laughs) And most things that I do, which usually is for, I would say, hopefully a good reason. Mm -hmm. And one reason, I don't remember exactly what I was writing now, but it was the community plan factor because... Let's talk about that. Yeah, Yeah. it's actually extremely important and I'm glad you're bringing it up because I need to get my head around it again. The county's in the process of redoing their um, general plan and their community plans. So what we had before, and that was in 2007, they were adopted Mm -hmm. into land use. So their actual laws was our general plan, development code, which is countywide. And then I think it was 13, don't quote my number on that one, um, communities had community plans. So mm-hmm. Joshua Tree was one, um, Lucerne Valley, I believe. There's a whole bunch. Mm-hmm. Let's go away. I mean, like way, way across sure. the mountain region, the desert Because we region. are huge. Yeah, yeah, and almost all of them were literally in the mountains or above the mountains and then across to the desert. Because San Bernardino is in a city and county, the headquarters, and they have very different concerns. Right. Than the unincorporated areas. Yeah, right. and each unincorporated area is distinct, has its own identity and, and own own things to worry about. So there really should be individual mm-hmm. community plans <laughs> right. that lay out, you know, what's going on with the community. A whole bunch of us, or a few of us, feel very strongly in, instead of what they're doing now, which is they're they've basically thrown out the community plans, and. I guess I can say it on the radio. I'm a little worried because I think we were successful with, you know, what we did with Altamira. And even though they kept telling us, oh, you won't win in court with that, you won't win in court with that, the language was there. It was adopted into law. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it was very clear that zoning had to change to align with the community plans and the general plans. So that's the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. At the county, they were telling us the opposite, that the hierarchy was a zoning that's not correct. So, okay. and that was the big point. Do a lot of research and sure. sh- shout out code <laughs> code numbers and ordinances and everything. So then all of a sudden, all the community plans basically disappeared, mm. and they came back to us with these suggested action plans, which was our term because it says SAP, because they were basically putting all the onus on right. the land trust or poor Tammy over at Parks and Rec had to do a whole land use mapping. She has, you know, she has to worry about the classes and right. tennis court keys, the programming and yeah. maintenance, not land use planning. That's not right. what that's about. So it was very much like passing the buck to oh, individuals for sure. and, and right. it was and stuff we'd already done too. Basically a waste of money. It was like nice suggestions, we'll put that in the library, you know. For right, reference. exactly. That's about as good as it gets. And luckily they listened to us because we said very clearly that's not a land use document. Mm-hmm. We had a land use document that wasn't great, but at least a lot of it was there and mm-hmm. people had worked really hard to get it to that point back in like 2004, 2007. Mm-hmm. And I was going to those meetings. I had little kids. It was a big effort to get there, you know, and then they, they kept trying to do the Jedi mind trick on us all this time that they didn't matter, but they did. And unfortunately, I mean, I'm glad we didn't go to court with Altamira, but mm-hmm. at one point I wish we had because yeah. we could have gotten that precedent. So what is the, is there a current deadline for comments on this community plan? Not 100% sure. So what is still the countywide plan? They just, I think they just released the EIR environmental impact report for the community plans. Yeah, to look at. I don't think there's actually a deadline to review it, but they are taking comments now. So that's important. Yes. There has been some suggested zoning changes. I feel very strongly we need to come together again as a community, sit down quietly and peacefully really think about this Mm -hmm. because I think a lot of people who need apartments or multifamily housing are being sort of not thought about. Right, not considered. Yeah, it went to like too much density to too big 
like plots mm. in some locations. Other right. locations we want that, right. but we really need to sit down and look at it as a community. This has been going on. People have been talking about what the future Joshua Tree is, but it's changed so much with Airbnbs sure. and all that, which technically aren't even allowed in the code. <laughs> right. So whatever, I know they're working on the new ordinance, but you know, really it's no one had a right to do anything with Airbnb. So mm-hmm. the ordinance should be really looked at. Well, and I carefully. call it the bastardized version of Airbnb because the original Airbnb was, oh, I have an extra room in my house I'm yeah. not using. Not, That's perfect. Oh, I yeah. have an extra house I'm not yeah. using. Yeah, yeah. And you know what I'm saying? It's seriously impacting so. the rental market. Is, right. I mean, it's huge impact. We can make that rental ordinance, whatever it needs to be, and mm-hmm. it, it should be about us locally as a community. Absolutely. And, and as we always are, we're looking out for our people that are coming to the park. That's right. part of our mission statement living here. Right. It really is. You have because what I that. say is as soon you know. as it starts to look like Yucca Valley or as soon as it starts to look just like Orange County with yeah. Dollar General's just the the tip of the iceberg at this point. The village is part of the experience, I think, for a lot of the people that come to the park. And once you start putting up what they have at home, why do they need... Yeah, they won't... What do they need to be here for? I'm seeing that just in... Like at the youth hostel, I know... I would... Back in... What was that? 88? I guess it was 88. No, no. 89. I would know exactly what country they were from. They would come in the door, oh, German, oh, French, Japanese. Yeah, I mean, it was just like really obvious mm-hmm. by the clothes. And we didn't have Eastern Europeans yet because the wall hadn't fallen down right. yet. <laughs> and then they came in later, you know, and, and Chinese have come in since. But you can't tell anymore until someone actually starts to speak because everyone's, you know, become right. whatever the word is, globalized, I guess. But more importantly, what I'm worried about are the people that are raising families here, mm-hmm. um, limited means their kids are at a certain point, how are they going to rent something? And we just had that situation where we were damn lucky to get a rental and Mm. could have been a bad situation. But, um, (laughs) I don't want to go into all that, but (laughs) it was very stressful and it was good to, it was good to have a reality check that Mm -hmm. how much the rents have gone up and how few options there were. So by just allowing people to come in and buy houses and rent them out short term, it's it's illegal. That's Mm. not what it is in the, in the zoning for each Mm. zone. It does not say short-term rentals. And it specifically said in the short-term rental code, I think, for the mountain, that it's only the mountain region that can do this. Oh, okay. As in nowhere else in the county. Right. So I think it's fantastic for people that are living here that have the trailer in the yard they want to rent out mm-hmm. or the extra room or the garage right. or they're buying a house right. and they're managing it because mm-hmm. they're right here. Or maybe there's a ratio where you buy one, you rent one long-term. Right. You know, maybe then you can do a short term, something like that, right. you know, some sort of ratio. Well, and I know that Santa Monica uh, within the last two years, I think, has put something in place that sounds very similar yeah. to that. I don't know all the details, but it was a little more, people don't like the word risk restrictive, but the fact of the matter is if you don't restrict some of it, it's just going to go wild and it's a huge problem. problem here. Right. No, exactly. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm with these people every day right? and I see what everyone's up against and like I said ourselves right yeah <laughs> you know, we went through the housing insecurity and sure. it was incredibly stressful it's difficult yeah, yeah. No, I mean very stressful right. and and we got so lucky that we found something and, and I can make it work but it was a hair's edge hair's wow. edge oh yeah gosh. so I don't want to talk about that but well <laughs> we thank you but you know what good, yeah but, but thank you for sharing yeah, that because it was a good for a lot of people check, right exactly you know, reality and, doesn't really hit home for a lot yeah, of people and so, to hear that someone in the community and so bravely yeah. talking about it so openly I mean, that makes you think a little bit about, yeah, what are we doing here? Yeah, and we do need to revisit what's happening with the county, with the community plan, get them back individual for each community versus right. having, they're, what they're trying to do now is they're trying to put all General. that language into mm-hmm. one huge plan and you, somehow you can magically search it. Well, I did a search <laughs> of what they had and, and the word Joshua came up like one time and there was nothing specific, mm. which means they're diluting it even more. So right. if we do have another Altamira come up, we're going to have a harder time finding it because I can't point the language. I had like... I forget how many pages spreadsheet. It was like, I don't know, six page spreadsheet of all the ordinances they weren't following mm. in Altamira in between the general plan, the development code, and the community plan. It wasn't oh just God. the community plan. The language was also in the general plan as well. Not that that should matter because all plans are given equal consideration of the law. Yeah, yeah, equal weight, yeah. And they all have to be consistent. That mm-hmm. is the law. Right. <laughs> so you can't, you can't have that inconsistency. And the zoning is supposed to be brought up to be consistent with the plans right. within a reasonable amount of time. Yeah. And that's what didn't happen there, and it should right. have. Yeah. So, But we, we need to have more than just the MAC crew at this. We need to have the schools. Yeah. We need to have the churches come together and just mm. really look at this problem. 
Because, um, and I don't want people to end up homeless in this sure. desert. There's already tons. We it's already a have a huge right. amount in the exactly. school district. Huge yeah. amount. Huge percentage in the school district that are technically homeless. Yeah. So how um, do we bring that group together? Who does that? Well, it'd be nice, like at the MAC meetings, if we had someone from the school district mm-hmm. based on reporting at the MAC meetings, so get mm-hmm. the community and the schools interspersed. The school district meetings, you know, I've gone to a few of them, obviously, when there was something relevant, but they are really hard to sit through because there's so many technical things, yeah. and there isn't much time to actually speak about it. So mm-hmm. really, if the school could send someone to the MAC meetings, and, and they give a presentation mm-hmm. like the FIRE does and all that. And, I think that they've just you know. started doing that when you watch the the most oh, recent. Oh, the last one? Oh, good. Wayne, I can't remember his last name. Hamilton, maybe? Maybe. Yeah, he's um, the one that does the outreach for the homeless. Right, and, and he district. was he was at the meeting, right. too. And they did have him, room good. for him to speak, like, with the safety reports, the public safety uh, oh, people. Oh, good. So hopefully they're so going to keep doing that. Yes, that would that's be fantastic. Helpful. Yeah. Right. Asking about the yeah. And then Mark, as well, with the county, right. you know, to do yeah. that as well. But the other thing is, you know, with the churches, like have more interaction because they know what the deal is within their sure. parishes or whatever it's yeah. called. <laughs> just been in England. Yeah. You know, their, their families, their church families, right. communities, church yeah. communities, veterans group, you know, just the right. different reach out and just have some meeting where we're all in the room together and yeah. let's talk about this. Get the start getting the concerns down and you yeah. know, envisioning something. Yeah, out. and where is a good spot? Because we have all the flooding issues. So it's not just yeah. a simple solution of, oh, we, we need more houses. We need to think about where. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's so many washes, so right. many dangerous roads. That is a factor. Well, we saw as well. that last October was a yeah. big eye opener, I bet, for a lot of people oh, that yeah, haven't yeah. been here. I was I was shocked. Yeah. yeah, I didn't have any issues here, fortunately. I mean, the road right. sunset gets a little quirky, but um, I didn't have any issues, but I know a lot of people did. Oh, yeah, no, it was, right where I live. Yeah. And then, yeah, 2014, we had a, yeah, it was very, very, I guess, like, like almost like a PTSD when it rains because of 2014 yeah. now. Because, yeah. yeah, anyway, it was very stressful. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're going to end on a less stressful okay, note. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> but I love that you were here today and you made the time, and I really appreciate it because I think a lot of what you have to say is very important for people to hear. So, for my Patreon supporters who get a <laughs> Diary Unlocked episode every week for their generous support of the podcast, may I have you select four numbers between 1 and 50? Good heavens. All right. 22. Okay. 33. <laughs> <laughs> 44, and let's mix it up with a 12. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, and if you are listening for the first time and you're not uh, familiar with The Diary Unlocked, that is a exclusive content that's available to my very generous Patreon supporters. You can find out more about it by going to DesertLadyDiaries.com, click on the support page, and then check out the Patreon option. The questions that Janet will answer will be, how would your best friend describe you? What was your most memorable birthday? Your top three favorite pizza <laughs> toppings. <laughs> no idea. Oh. And what is something that was better back then than it is now? Wow. That's a good one. <laughs> so again, if you're interested in hearing Janet's answers to those questions, head out to DesertLadyDiaries.com, click on the support page, and check out Patreon. Thanks again for being here. I really appreciate uh, it. Thank you so much. It's been great. <laughs> I really appreciate all the time Janet has put in to advocate on behalf of this community to make sure 100 plus acres of desert were not scraped for a development that didn't fit into our community anyway. So when you see her, please thank her. We talked about a number of ways neighbors can get involved, not only to be informed about what's happening in our community, but to get involved with ideas and time. One of those places is the monthly Municipal Advisory Council. The MAC meets on the third Monday of the month at the Joshua Tree Community Center on Sunburst. Meetings begin at 5.30, and there is time allotted for public comment. If you've never been, I highly encourage you to come out and listen and participate. If you'd like to watch any previous MAC meetings, they are available on YouTube by Googling Bob Stevenson. He's the camera and audio guy that makes all that happen. And it's S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S-O-N. And if you add Big Mac, Big M-A-C, and subscribe so you're alerted when a new video is uploaded, you'll be in the know. It's a great way to catch up if you miss a meeting or go out there to discover things you may not have known about the community. I watched and listened to a number of them prior to moving here, and it was just another way for me to learn about the community. The next Mac meeting is September 16th at 530, so if you're interested, introduce yourself if you see me there. I have some shout-outs this week to new patron, Susan. Thank you so much for your support, Susan. I really appreciate you. And to Patty, who recently signed up for the weekly newsletter. Patty, you are the 100th subscriber, so thank you very much. 
And thanks so much for completing the listener survey. I really appreciate your feedback, comments, and suggestions. And if you haven't done it yet, it's still open for your feedback and comments. Most of the questions are multiple choice, and there is one option to write some freeform comments to. So just click the yellow Take the Survey button on the homepage of DesertLadyDiaries.com. It's just 10 questions and will take you less than 10 minutes. Thank you. If you're interested in checking out another local podcast, Catherine Svela from episode 49 lives here in Joshua Tree and is here to tell you a bit about her podcast, Myth Matters. Are you looking for a new way to think and transform? Tune into Myth Matters, a bi weekly podcast of storytelling and conversation about mythology and why it's important to life today. Find a more creative way to live. Learn more at mythicmojo.com and keep the mystery in your life alive. See you next week. Thanks so much for listening.